yep i'm live giving you the link Let's wait for a few people to come in before we start. And also, I'd appreciate if uh, there are any questions that you have, or there is something that uh, you can't understand right now. Please let me know so we can take it in that direction. So I can resume now. So what we were discussing the last was that how in 375, 377, even though now after Navtej Singh Johar, there appears to be no intelligible differentia why we have two separate sections talking about the same thing. Yet in, in terms of the IPC, there are two separate sections altogether. Um, and this perhaps, of course, evades my understanding. Um, and there is what one needs to also understand the purpose of having an amendment bill is to in no way take away the protection that women have under the laws. And of course, it's been a very long battle to get the legislation today here where it is in terms of rape laws in our country. Um, but it is my personal opinion that if you understand the fundamental rights and everything that the constitution actually imbibes, um, you cannot have a democracy, you cannot have equality in the truest sense. Um, if there are no parimeteria laws for men and women, that is one thing. And the other is that protection it, when it comes to somebody's body. That is that protection should be equal when it comes to persons of any gender, any biological, any biological sex. And we should not uh, continue to think that it is only women who can who can suffer rape um, at, at the hands of men. Uh, and it can be the other way around in positions of power. It can be a man violating another man's body. It can be a female doing it for another female. It And of course, if we've gone ahead and we've made this distinction that there is what is gender and biological sex, these are two separate distinct uh, concepts altogether, then we also perhaps need to understand that protection needs to be given for both gender and sex. And we cannot just be completely... Um, centered and completely because i'm so sorry completely cornered when it comes to that only providing protection for women and women alone uh, and for this fact if you also see the definition of what is gender in person in uh, the ipc that only talks about man or woman even the ipc till now even though in 2014, transgender persons have been recognized as the third gender by the Supreme Court, but the IPC fails to make that uh, differentiation as well. 
okay so there is a question that has come uh, with regard to yes of course uh, a man being raped by another man that exact exactly is what we are trying to say um if people have not gone through the contents of the bill right now i'll also just make you understand that we've already read 375 and i don't want to keep reiterating because it it will get very mundane right now um uh, what we are proposing in 375 is that let the contents be the same as 375 has it now um but let the differentiation come when it comes to the definition you say that a man is said to commit rape rape if he so wherever there is use of a man or woman that should be replaced by any person so equality in terms of protection is given to violation of any person's body and you cannot just say that the violation is only of a particular gender or of a particular biological sex and that is what the differentiation is and for that we've also amended the definition of uh, person and gender as you have it in the IEPC to have an effective reading of it to the second question when somebody is asked uh, 377 yeah so with regard to what navdeep singh johar says about 377 as i've said it before they of course uh, said that 377 is in two parts uh, and they create this differentiation of consensual carnal intercourse and non consensual carnal intercourse and this differentiation created by the supreme court in the judgment is actually not found in the 37 in the section uh, the provision language of 377 if you could also just see the definition of 375 and the explanation given under it um, it also describes what is consent and willingness but the same explanation is not found under 377 so as the legislation's intention if we see um, applying interpretation of statutes there was no intention as it appears to make any differentiation when it comes to consensual or non consensual 377 and that is perhaps just something that is through interpretation that the supreme court has done which has in fact complicated matters further because as the media has it and the lay layman understands they always thought 377 as um gay law because that's how it was projected to us but if you see the bare contents of it it is applicable just as much to any heterosexual couple and uh, which is perhaps something which has completely evaded the sense of the court um, in understanding or perhaps they did not want to dwell into this complication at that time and that's exactly why uh, we found it uh, fit to present this law which of course uh, takes care of the loopholes that we have now so in the proposed law of criminal amendment uh, act we have a uh, criminal amendment bill we have apart from 375 also looked into 354 um, and 509 and 506 as well but there has also been an introduction of 375a if you uh, have noticed that because our country we have what is called a sexual harassment in 354a and we have rape now sexual harassment as you know it is all in terms of gestures and words and rape as we've discussed it many a times in this session that it is the actual act of violating a person's body right but there is a third category and that is assault so that has not been looked into by the legislature because what we feel is that simply by brushing against somebody's body intentionally that should not amount to a punishment of 7 to life that is very very harsh so the sexual the law for sexual assault as proposed in 375a uh, though recognizes that any kind of violation in terms of uh, 
physicality where physicality is involved and it is a step ahead from uh, what you see in sexual harassment and is not uh, squarely covered under rape or rather it's also very harsh in terms of that is now also covered under what is sexual assault in 375a and it's punishable up to 3 years i'm just just reading the question just one second please okay so yeah with regard to uh, gender neutrality as a uh, gentleman has asked uh, are transgender people in uh, in other countries also included in uh, gender neutrality of sexual offenses yes 63 countries uh, as of 2019 had already in inculcated gender neutral laws including transgender persons but we have to understand that if we are talking about equality in the truest sense we are talking about uh, the protection under the law even though the concept of um, protection under article 14 is what it actually means is equality amongst equals so there is this is that concept which a lot of people uh, fail to understand or interpret incorrectly article 14 does not mean that equality amongst all it is among uh, equality amongst equals but the idea that we project forward today is that a violation on somebody's body is scarring on every person in terms of psychological trauma and the victimology that uh, the victimization that that is subjected to them you can't take away that saying that it is just because it's not a woman and it's a transgender person or a man that they would not be feeling the same psychological mental physical trauma and be scarred to that extent uh, that that would be a very very unfair presumption to make and that is exactly why even though article 14 says it's only equality amongst equals but the violation of a person's um, their their body is deemed to have an equal effect on persons irrespective of their gender and their biological sex so yes to answer that already 63 countries have looked into it and we we hope that our country also um with this bill can look into that uh no so when it comes to section 8 of the bill that's exactly why the definition and uh, this this while drafting it i remember it there was a long deliberation that took place between uh, mr tulsi mr uh, doc dr shashi tharur who was also uh, a part of this bill and uh, he was planning to actually introduce it introduce it in the lok sabha but uh, that didn't take that didn't uh, materialize but the way we have worded transgender persons is that it's not we did not want to go and define what transgender means the idea to keep it is that not limited to transgender persons means that tomorrow if another category of persons comes in like we have we had lgbt then it became lgbtq and now it's lgbtq plus so in terms of categorization as people would like to identify themselves uh, and their sexual orientation that is a very fluid concept as we've seen in international law we've seen it here in our country um, people are um, identifying themselves as different uh, genders and it's they say that it's, it's a very very fluid concept so we don't want to get into the nuances of that and the idea of keeping it not limited to transgender persons is so that um in the future if there is a new categorization that comes in they still would be protected under this law so that's exactly why when you look into drafting of a legislation you have to be very careful because it's essentially a few people in a room who sit together and make a law but you also have to understand the repercussions the actual ramifications that will take place of what you write today that could effectively take away somebody's right from them so it's very important to be mindful of these concepts and in words cannot be limited to that um 
and as i've said it before uh, the definition of transgender persons which is there in the 2018 uh, uh, 2019 act in the 2017 bill uh that has actually not been accepted by the transgender community and that is also uh something that is under protest and challenge so uh from our from our point of view we have not even gone by the definition as recognized by nalsa because nalsa was also fairly limited to eunuchs and hermaphrodites and we want to go beyond that so that of course is for the parliament to also see where exactly to till what extent do they allow this uh, because right now is sub judas no um, so this question by one miss anjali says that shouldn't eight section 8 then state others or other persons after transgender so it says it's lim- it's including but not limited to so that includes all other persons who recognize themselves as transgenders and for the fact that we've specifically gone and mentioned transgender persons is because though they were recognized in 2014 but the ipc was never amended for them so that's exactly why only transgender persons have been pointed out so distinctively but because it's uh, not limited to uh as mentioned in sec- the amendment of section 8 it includes every other person uh with regard to any other sections being there uh of course you can also look into the marriage laws for one if uh i i believe in in one of the high courts uh, transgender persons were given the right to marry as well so tomorrow a possible amendment would be required in the hindu laws christian laws as well as uh, the the specific laws for, of any other sect which allows uh, transgender persons to get married and in those terms people who are whose gender is not man or woman should also be allowed and that is perhaps another amendment to be seen but uh, not in the ipc ipc is now squarely covered where it comes to any discernible uh, differentia with regard to persons or with regard to gender or biological sex okay the other questions i'll take up later let me just quickly wrap up so that after that we can open the floor to more questions um, but what i would like to ask before i go ahead is that uh, with all that has been said so far is there any point of confusion anything that requires more clarification in what i've spoken about if not then i'll just quickly go ahead and conclude uh, why we are introducing this bill uh with regard to marital rape see it's very difficult to comment upon for the fact that uh, you have something called the restitution of conjugal rights under section 9 so that essentially entails a person to go ahead and uh, get a decree from a court that if their spouse withdraws from their conjugal society and that especially uh, includes that they refuse to be intimate with them so because we have something like that and under the law it's very difficult to carve out a law on marital rape and that is why it's limited to um, girls uh, under the age of 15 because over there they still have the option of uh, rescinding from the marriage and it, it's voidable at consent so when they turn 18 they, they can choose to walk out of the marriage that's exactly why um, only girls up to the age of 15 have been given uh, the protection under marital rape so yeah um this is a good question the gravity of offense under 377 and 375 mm, think of it this way i do not think that if you apply um once you've applied the principles of interpretation of uh, of statutes 
you would understand that the contents of 377 and 375 are absolutely similar because if you see 375 sub clause a where it says that you penetrate with your penis into the vagina or any other body parts of a female similarly if you replace the fact that it's a man violating a woman and you see a man violating another man or in in terms of transgender persons or a female violating a man um other body parts manipulation of any other body part of a of a man or a woman the in so far as the violation is concerned that is the same yes so coming to how it applies on heterosexual couples you have to understand the definition there is this judgment of of the early 1900s of the uh, privy courts of uh, r versus emperor and that is the first i think is 1901 if i'm not mistaken and uh, if you read it's the first def- judgment that we have which actually talks about um what is the uh, judicial interpretation of carnal intercourse against the order of nature so because it says that any kind of intercourse that is not for procreation so recreational sex in sexual intercourse that anybody takes into account so that way even uh, wearing using contraceptives would apply to heterosexual couples right so that's one aspect of it and the second is when it's it's uh, anything other than penal vaginal sex right so if heterosexual couples would engage in um oral anal or any other forms and it's been recognized in our culture ever since uh kama sutra right so all those things also apply to heterosexual couples alike so this is a differentiation that has been created by the legislature not not taking into account that without you actually uh explaining in terms of a definition within the ipc or in the general clauses act um that what exactly entails carnal intercourse against the order of nature you've actually left no scope for an intelligible differentia between 375 and 377 and now 377 only stands for non consensual carnal intercourse which if effectively means rape so if without somebody's consent the bo- bo- body of another person is violated by manipulation of your mouth any other object your finger that is essentially 375 bcd so why do we have two sections today is the question and that is something that the legislature also needs to see that everything that you now except for bestiality so if you actually read the uh, 22000 uh, law commission report which is the 172nd law commission report that we are talking about after they proposed gender neutral sexual offenses for uh, in terms of perpetrator and victim under 375 they also uh, amended 377 at that time proposed the amendment of 377 in the law commission report and what remains of 377 after that is that only bestiality is uh, the remaining factor so any carnal intercourse with an an against the order of nature with an animal is an offense as per the law commission report and because everything is now in terms of uh, gender neutrality covered under 375 there is no need to have two separate sections which one gives you victimology um it gives you psycho it gives you an aspect uh, an insight into the psychological trauma that a person goes into and the other uh deems both the persons two or more persons engaging in it both as uh, criminals any other question on this and for this you will get a greater understanding of it if on your own time you can go up and read that prior to 
uh, actually amending uh, the definition of 375 before the uh, amendment took place as as we've already spoken about this that uh, 375 was only limited to penetration but penal vaginal penetration and that scope was also expanded now if that scope was actually not expanded under 375 then we would have understood that whatever is not penal vaginal orifice would be covered by 377 but that has been taken away and already included in 375 but only with the extent of man uh, man and woman and man being the perpetrator and woman being the victim in this Are there any other questions on the floor? So the burden of proof, if you see that that comes under uh, under the Evidence Act, that is in uh, 114A is where the burden of proof comes in. So um, usually the burden of proof is on the prosecution, right? So it, it has to remain the same. The prosecution has to prove because you have to understand that we are still applying this test for 375 BCD. So why not for other uh, for offenses which have taken place on uh, people other than women, on men and transgender and other persons? Yeah, this is this is something which has never been explored into that why 375 uh, see 377 is up to life but 375 is up to death so 375 of course has a greater maximum punishment which is death penalty though 377 is only up to life but the minimum punishment is 10 years because at that time when perhaps the uh legislation was being um, was being written this this was a taboo and people were looking down upon it and maybe for that reason the minimum punishment under 377 was greater than that of 375 see misuse is there even in terms of 375 that that we can't take away you also we also have to understand that just because every law there will be a possible misuse but you also have to understand that how many people are being sequestered from the present system and from even coming forward and addressing their uh, issues we've had the me too movement right and people are coming out and talking about it so what psychological studies have actually shown across the world is that when men get raped um, they of course cannot because people the society and our worldview does not allow for this adjustment especially in our country that a man has been raped and it it's it's cert certainly hits their ego and their sense of uh, machoism their sense of being and because they inherently start suppressing it they are not able to understand their own victimization. And that comes out in the form of aggression in leading to or leading to suicide or for a person to completely withdraw from society. And those are the aspects because they themselves, men, transgender persons, anybody who's not been able to come forward and seek justice or talk about justice is, of course, a longer process. But the first thing is to even recognize or even to come to terms with the fact that your body has been violated and um, to get proper help to help to uh, put yourself through the channel of healing. When you can't even come to terms with the fact that your body has actually been violated, it has, of course, a very, very negative impact uh, psychologically as well. So and what the studies show is that because men are not uh, given this proper forum in our country, they also start repressing it and it, it comes out in other ways than it's supposed to.
या प्रोमिसरी एनी काइंड ऑफ सेक्शुअल इंटरकोर्स ऑन द प्रीटेक्स ऑफ गेटिंग मैरिड दैट वुड एक्चुअली अमाउंट टू रेप एज पर द सुप्रीम कोर्ट uh we've already spoken about marital law uh and once this video is uploaded you could go back and uh, listen to it because i don't want to repeat yes definitely even uh, in in fact the only hindrance is that <clears throat> to explain to the court that there is a requirement for uh, even the the prevention of uh, sexual uh, sexual uh, offenses at workplace uh, to also be made gender neutral for the fact see we can take it to court but in these cases it's always better to come with some evidence with a person's testimony or uh, with some kind of study otherwise it becomes a very abstract concept that you're deliberating on a on an academic level unless and until you're able to show that actually a violation has taken place because our constitution actually says that when you talk about fundamental rights and protection um we can't take it away even if you say that a minuscule uh, section of the society is been suffering and just because the portion of people suffering is minuscule does not mean um is is not reason enough to deny any kind of amendment or any kind of progression in law so even if we find some data in terms of surveys of ngos coming forward with any any kind of data or a person who's been a victim who would like to come forward and uh, uh, talk about this process that how even uh, when it comes to workplace sexual harassment at workplace uh, to be made gender neutral i'm sure the court would consider this are there any other questions no they can't be because gender and sex are absolutely two different things altogether biological sex is the organs that you have when you are born right and gender is a social construct it means uh, your social identity and how through the process of socialization uh, whether you being a man identify yourself as a man or a woman or you being a woman identify yourself as a woman or a man so gender is a social construct that we evolve through socialization and sex is biological sex so you we cannot be replacing that because nobody can nobody can actually you're not looking into um, aspects where somebody has uh, changed their biological sex through any kind of surgery that's a different thing altogether no it's not restricted to that we are talking about gender Are there any other questions? Yes, of course there 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 is misuse you you at uh, with every, every given law there will be misuse and, and that's perhaps uh the most unfortunate aspect of it uh what i feel that in order to curb this uh, the law that we require is that um if at any point after the trial it's found that the entire claim was false even the complainant should um, essentially be convicted in that case for false in, for false uh, uh testimony there should be some process in the law to um punish a person who comes to court with false information because you are effectively um, destroying somebody's life their career and everything uh, that they stand for and you can't just walk scot free after doing so and perhaps 
from my own personal experience and this is a, a whole new uh, session altogether of course in our uh, being being a defense lawyer i myself see that when people come forward and there have been times where under sexual offenses men have been uh, booked on absolute false grounds but uh, it it takes years to prove that are there any questions with regard to the bill or we can close it uh, and i believe that everybody is understood it then in that case um i would really appreciate if there are some questions that you have uh, apart from that any discussion that you need to do i'll of course be leaving my email id as well and uh, we can take a tap over there because i don't want to keep people online if you're not discussing anything because from my end i've explained to you the journey why this was intervention was required uh, all the chronology behind why exactly uh, Uh, an intervention of this sort is by is uh, sought from the parliament and this bill was introduced in 2019 in the rajya sabha and it's pending at the moment so if there are any questions uh, with regard to this please let me know apart from that uh, then we could perhaps end the session and i'll leave my email id here and we can take it forward and you can email me or uh, reach out to me on linkedin for any further discussion thank you so much uh, for being so patient and listening